Everyone was absolutely certain it was all going to go straightforwardly. Joey hadn't got it. Your efforts, if they are successful, will ensure the freedom of many, many people. There were sea splashes around the side of our landing craft, but such was my confidence. It never possibly occurred to me that the Germans could be firing back. At the first man I seen dead, I, th I looked at him and I thought, well, why is he sleeping? Because I was so naive about it. There were him. machine guns firing at us from the hotels and houses right on the, on the beachhead. And I was very hesitant to get off that boat. There were three bodies. Two of them were very badly burnt, black. The other one was, was sort of flying. They were all French. At the end of it, uh, we had 75 on our feet out of 150, wounded lying about on the ground, getting wounded again by the German shells. Most of us guessed, quite early in 1944, that we'd be crossing the Channel that summer. What we never imagined, and could scarcely believe when we saw it all coming together, was the sheer scale of the thing. There was the Navy, with enough capital ships to fight a battle of Jutland, and all those devices we didn't know existed, like swimming tanks and a transportable harbour. The invasion was a marvel of planning, and it had to be right first time. For the Western Allies, this would be the decisive battle. Its outcome would shape the second half of the 20th century. Compared to this, everything else up to now, the Battle of Britain, North Africa, Italy, had been a chipping away at the edges of German military power. Overlord, the invasion of France would be decisive. If it failed, there would be no second chance. 50 years later, we know it succeeded. What people forget, including some who were there, was that in those first few weeks after D-Day, the margin between success and failure was narrow. The only previous attempt at a cross-channel assault had been a disaster. In August 1942, 5,000 Canadian troops had tried to capture and briefly hold the port of Dieppe. The plan was fatally flawed. A frontal attack over a beach of loose shingle, a natural tank trap, and without a massive preliminary bombardment. Nearly half the Canadians failed to return from the raid. Dieppe taught the Allies how not to invade an enemy's coast. Ah. Oh. <laughs> das sind Sie da. Das bin, das bin ich. Und like many German soldiers in France, Lieutenant Raymond Steiner had fought and was wounded in Russia. In Normandy, he was looking forward to a quiet life in command of a battery of coastal guns he was unlikely ever to fire. And that is the first Kasematte. Here you see again the whole general. But Steiner's illusions were quickly shattered. In January 1944, Hitler put his favorite general, Field Marshal Rommel, in command of coastal defenses from Holland to Brittany. So bringen sich Briten und Amerikaner in Invasionsstimmung. Darüber hinaus verbinden sie damit die Hoffnung... Rommel launched a crash program to plug the gaps in the Normandy sector of Hitler's Atlantic War. He argued that the battle must be fought on the beaches, while the bulk of the invading force was still at sea. If the enemy ever established a bridgehead, so Rommel argued, he would sooner or later break out. By June, the German defenses were looking formidable. Lieutenant Steiner had been provided with a personal bunker overlooking the beaches and an armored underground telephone line to direct his guns, housed in bomb-proof casements a mile inland. That was my Here, 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 here. This is my observation post. In here was my periscope. I used to sit on an ammunition chest, and here was the periscope where these two hooks are. Next to it was my telescope, which I used most of the time because the periscope reflected too much and had a narrow view. From the invasion, there was a lot of talk about the 
There was constant talk of invasion in the papers and amongst ourselves. People feared it was coming. There was a threat hanging over us. But we were all hoping that it would happen further north, where the coastal positions were ready. We used to tell each other it wouldn't happen here, otherwise we'd have been better prepared. Allied intelligence had built up a detailed picture of Rommel's defences, but the raid on Dieppe had shown it was vital to make sure the beaches were firm enough to support heavy vehicles. So, Two-man teams of swimmers landed in France by night to collect samples of sand. Major Logan Scott Bowden says the most difficult bit was getting off the beach again and back to their recovery boat. We got to the area we wished to look at, and we took about ten samples each. The one chap who took them put them in the other chap's bandolier of tubes, which were all numbered, and we made a note on our underwater writing tablets of, of where we'd taken them. And so out we went, festooned with all our usual clubber, you know, pistol and commando knife and compass and wristwatch, plus these bandoliers. And we were very smartly knocked back by the breakers. And we thought we hadn't tried quite hard enough, so we had another go. And we got it just right and got through. And uh, I swam rather harder than Ogden Smith and um, thought I'd lost him. And then I saw a raised arm a little bit behind me and heard him yelling. So I swam back to him, thinking he was in trouble, either with cramp or else he got a hole in his suit. And all he was yelling was Happy New Year. <laughs> and uh, I didn't reciprocate immediately. I told him to swim a good deal harder. <laughs> and, and then I relented and wished him a Happy New Year too. On D-Day, Michel Grimaud from the village of grace mer was 11 years old. As a local, he was forbidden to use the beach. What about this beach? Did you ever get here? Did you come down and play on the beach? When you we there? used to come and play on the beach and walk on the beach, but uh, we couldn't do it uh, after the summer 1943, because then it was uh, entangled with all the obstacles that the Germans began to place mm. anti-tank things and mines and, and very uh, old devices of that type. Yeah. And the accesses to the beach, the lanes and roads were also closed. So this was a pity because we couldn't use the beach as a playground. It was quite dangerous because it was impossible. You, you, you were meant to be killed. It was not only the Germans who were killing French civilians. In the months before D-Day, thousands of French people lost their lives in prolonged and intensive Allied bombing of French communications. But the air offensive was vital. By paralyzing the railways and destroying bridges all across northern France, the Allies effectively isolated Normandy. That added hugely to the German army's problems of supply and was to delay the arrival of German reserves in the battle zone. The first men to land in France on D-Day would be airborne. The first in action would crash land in gliders. They'd trained for this for two years. And after we'd uh, been training 18 months or so, they got a bit restive, and I knew, and it was a worry for me that uh, they should be so, because anybody's restive, uh, this type of man, uh, they go looking for trouble, or getting into trouble. We were so trained up, we had energy we didn't know what to do with. If you can imagine a couple of boxers in the ring like that, or getting a, that's how we were, literally. We were hyped up. Some were under age for the forces. Uh, I came home from work one day. The old lady across the, I uh, lived in a block of flats, across the passage said, all your family's gone, they've been uh, evacuated. So I thought, oh, well, you know, I'll stay for a bit. And uh, after two or three weeks, I got a bit browned off being bombed down in Canning Town. And uh, I thought, well, I'll join the army. So I went up to the recruiting office. She said, um, how old are you? I said, 18. She said, you got your birth certificate? I said, no, it's lost in the blitz. Sign here, he says. And that was it. Do you think they knew you were 16? Oh, sure. Yeah, there were loads of us. I think they were just short of uh, 
It's all a manpower. They would took out Tate anyway. I'm sure they knew. I mean, we look 16. What are you at, underage, weren't you? Just before the war, at the age of uh, uh, 16 or 10 months, I got my birth certificate and uh, altered it. Took it up uh, town, and at that time I was 17, and they signed me on, and I joined the Gloucesters. They promised me a uniform, free accommodation, a chance to see the world, young man. I went straight in there. Seven months later, they declared war. I think it was probably about the end of May when we were addressed by our Colonel A.R. Woolley, and he said, please feel that your efforts if they are successful, will ensure the freedom of many, many people in Europe who are awaiting this release from the tyranny of the Nazis. And he said, treat it almost like a crusade. Three weeks before D-Day, the invasion troops were confined to camp. Secrecy was vital. Barbed wire prevented contact with civilians. There was no leave. When special invasion money was issued, French francs, everyone knew this was real. The army even passed out guidebooks, complete with useful phrases. Good day, which is the way to the Arc de Triomphe? And it was at this stage that some men began to produce complaints of bad backs and bad feet, and medical boards were held. And I was asked to sit on one of them, and my attitude, quite frankly, was that they know something's coming and they want out now, why on earth should they? Uh, and fortunately, the president of the board was a much wiser man, and he said, how would you feel if it was one of these chaps who was guarding your back on sentry duty. He said, if at this stage they want to get out, they're no use, and we'll downgrade them as unfit for active service. We were trained as a top athlete would be. We were taken up to the top of the hill. Another fortnight's training, and we would have started to go downhill. Sid Knight and Len Daniels were sergeants in the 9th Battalion, the Parachute Regiment. Lieutenant Colonel Terence Otway was their commanding officer. He'd been a professional soldier since 1933. Colonel Otway was, was uh, a man that you couldn't get through to. Um, he was a very hard man, very standoffish, as, as naturally you would expect a, a commanding officer to be. No tolerance for a fool whatsoever. You could, dare not make a mistake with the Colonel. But he was a man that I, I think I must say in all honesty, I hated intensely as our CO. Your men don't seem to particularly have liked you as an officer. Fair comment. Did that worry you? No. Uh, that may sound pompous and conceited, but I don't think a senior officer's job is to work on being liked. He should be respected. Yes, I wanted to be respected, and I wanted to be considered to be a fair person, but I wouldn't go out of my way to get popularity. I wanted an efficient, well-run, happy battalion, and I reckoned I had it. For the invasion, the Bay of the Seine had been divided into five beaches. The British and Canadians would land on three beaches, codenamed Sword, Juno, and Gold. The Americans were to capture Omaha and Utah beaches. The first objective was to protect the bridgehead's two flanks from counterattack by dropping troops from the air. The Americans would drop in the west, the British would land by parachute and in gliders east of the River Orne on the likely line of approach of German armoured divisions. Major John Howard and his company were to capture two bridges over the Orne and its adjacent canal, an operation demanding perfect navigation great daring and complete surprise. We'd been told that we'd be the first to land, which boosted up the already high morale even more. Our standard of training was so high, we were glad to get into action and, and get the ruddy war over and the Nazi regime. We never knew about adrenaline in those days. I don't think it had been invented, but we had it. 
Mm. And we were just raring to go. When they weighed the glider and found out that it was well overweight, John Howard says, well, one of you have got to drop out the 25 platoon. I want one volunteer, but he couldn't find one. So uh, we had to drop some equipment off instead of my <laughs> man. You volunteer Wally Parr. <laughs> yes, I did. Did, didn't I did. I said, uh, Wally Parr's got said, two kids, Parr's let him go. And, uh, yeah. got a couple of kids, why don't he drop out? And he did his nut and uh, stayed. So we dropped some gear off the glider and that was it. We all went. Just before we took off, I'd been round to all the gliders and, and gave them what I call my ham and jam farewell, which was this success signal of uh, that. And by the time I got back to the glider, I'm sure I had a lump in my throat as big as a damn football. Um, I was a bit emotional as we took off, as I remember it quite well. Well, the thing I remember most about it is the euphoria. Everyone was absolutely certain it was all going to go. Jerry hadn't got a chance. It, it was all going to go straightforwardly. Uh, and everyone was terribly happy and terribly enthusiastic about it. The invasion date was to be the 5th of June, one of only three days in the month when both the tide and the moonlight would suit. May had ended in blazing sunshine. But when embarkation began on June the 2nd, the weather broke. Loading continued over the weekend while a storm blew up in the channel. But to unload the ships and delay the invasion for at least two weeks was unthinkable. In weather that was far from ideal, Tuesday, June the 6th, would be D-Day. The sea was crashing against the OCT, which is a flat bottom boat, very unpleasant. And all my Birmingham lads were feeling very seasick, as I was. I wouldn't go down below because the people were sort of being ill over each other. The stench was awful. The landing craft was literally a vomiting vessel. It was, everybody was on top deck. Even first line troops were going to go ashore on the first day were dreadfully seasick. They were lying on the deck and they really uh, were incapable of anything. I wondered how they were going to cope. I spent the whole night behind the wheelhouse watching that masked going around and around and around. The only remedy we had was hyacinth, which makes you very sleepy. And there was a limit to the amount of hyacinth you could give to a man who was going to have to go charging up the beach with a gun shortly. I was feeling very well, and I had about three bacon and egg breakfasts, and then about five o'clock, they said, there is an issue of rum. And I thought, well, I'll have some of that. I'd had about, I would say, about four tots of really strong naval rum, 100% proof, 57.1% of alcohol by volume, and uh, it really gave me a warm inner glow and, uh, and a, a cur courage which made me not have come about if I hadn't had that rum. And I knew that uh, once we got to the French Channel, I knew, knew this from the, the winko of the bombers, Halifax bombers towing us, uh, that at a precise spot on the French coast, the bomber pilot would say, right, cast off. And then we heard the bomber flying away, and we were immediately aware of the quietness as we swished away, and the sound of the bomber died away. And we were doing a steep dive. And when he gave us the tip again that he was levelling out, and we could feel it, we opened the doors. I looked down, and immediately, I recognised where we were. You see, I'd been studying these aerial photographs, the shapes of fields and woods and churches with spires. I could see where I was, and I knew we were on course. The drill for landing, which we'd practised very often, of course, in those uh, wooden boxes, coffins, as the men called them, was to link arms with the man either side of you, 
Put your fingers into a butcher's grip, lift your legs and just pray to God your number wasn't up. There's nothing else you could do about it. We were all in the hands of those glider pilots. And uh, the first thing I remember is that colossal bump. Danny Brotheridge leaned over, whipped open the door, uh, called out, gun out, and out I went with a Bren. And as soon as we were all in position, Danny Brotheridge came through, said, come on, lads, and up we got, and uh, off we went, charging like mad up this slope onto the bridge, and um, about a oh, quarter of the way over, I saw this German sentry at the end, and he appeared to me to be firing a very light pistol. And I just opened up and uh, he went down. And we carried on, got to the end of the bridge. And at the end of the bridge was Danny Brotheridge. He had been killed coming across. Lieutenant Brotheridge was the first identified British soldier to be killed on D-Day. The time was half an hour after midnight. <coughs> Let's get over the bumps. Five miles northeast of Pegasus Bridge was another top priority target. A massive gun battery able to fire on Sword Beach. Number three. Do you remember that one? Just seeing it, that's all. Because I made for this one, you see. Yeah. Number one, you see. Yeah. At 3 a.m., Colonel Otway and his men were to storm its four casemates and silence the guns by dawn before the first wave of landing craft came within range. So this one must have had a steel door on it, did it? This one here? They all had steel doors. They all had steel doors. Uh, some were shut and some were open. No, I'm coming around this side. To reach the Merville battery, the Paris had to rush through barbed wire, a minefield, and a curtain of machine gun fire. You dropped yeah. the grenades down the shaft. That took them to the casemates, where reinforced concrete with several feet of earth on top had defeated the bombers of the RAF. Normally, we would, when we bowed up an aircraft, it would take us some little while to reach the ground. But I bailed out on D-Day, and almost instantly I was on the ground. And I looked round for friends and relations and uh, what have you, and there was no one there. I was on my own. I'd have gone, go, what's happened? Well, see, next to no time, the green light's on, and the first man's out, and out they're gone. I went to go, and I couldn't move. I couldn't move. The clothing had got caught on something at the door. So I hammered on this door like mad, you know, and it must have been what? You can't really tell, but it must have been three, four seconds afterwards. The door opened and I saw a chink of light, I slid along the floor and out. See? Well, by that time, I'm, what, quite a way away from the, from the DZ, see, the dropping zone. In the event, the parachute drop was disastrous. Nearly half Otway's battalion landed in areas flooded by the Germans. Many were drowned. Others were dropped 20 to 30 miles from the dropping zone. Otway had set off from England with 750 men. Two hours after the drop, only 150 had reached the rendezvous. All their special equipment was missing. Did you consider aborting the operation and saying, I can't do it? <laughs> yes, for about five seconds. Uh, and I realized I was being a bloody fool. There was no option but to go on. Each assault party was about a third only of their original strength. And they went straight to the batteries, went straight in, and attacked the crews. They were firing from the hip from the moment they went through the wire until the moment they reached the inside of the casement so that they were dealing with anybody who happened to be in the way. And there were already heaviest infantry fights. There was fierce hand-to-hand -hand fighting. It was totally chaotic. There was artillery fire, machine gun fire, and single shots everywhere. You couldn't tell who was shooting at whom, where the enemy was, where the fire was coming from. It was a shambles. It was a mess. There was smoke about. There were German artillery uh, shells firing on us. <coughs> and so uh, I personally 
took shelter in in the first casement I could, and one had to move very carefully from casement to casement. And at the end of it, uh, we had 75 on our feet out of 150, wounded lying about on the floor, on the ground, getting wounded again by the German cells. The whole area was pervaded by this most um, peculiar smell, freshly turned earth, uh, torn flesh, blood, cordite, and that sort of thing. And it's a smell that you never forget it. Almost like uh, if you go for an operation to a hospital, you smell ether for the first time, you never forget it. The inside of one of the casemates is now a museum and a memorial. I don't know, I find it, I can put faces to faces, but not names to faces no. necessarily. That's Fred Dawkins, who died last year. Yeah. Yeah. The end but on. did the Perras destroy Steiner's guns? Steiner says no. Since the war, he's always asserted that he brought his battery back into action after the attack was over. That's true. But how soon was he able to fire his guns? Were they in action on D-Day? The argument has raged for years. We questioned Steiner closely. Reluctantly, Otway, Daniels and Knight agreed to meet him. Steiner now revealed that though his guns survived the attack, his crews did not. After the battle, his battery strength was down to only six unwounded men. After D-Day, Steiner got reinforcements. But he agrees that his battery was out of action while the assault was taking place on Sword Beach. Number four gun was totally out of action as a result of the attack. And number three gun they couldn't really use because they were digging under the battery, under the casement, to get this unexploded bomb out. Well, you can tell him he's the first man who's confirmed what we have always said about number four gun. Aber Otway sagt, wir haben, wir haben Colonel Otway sagt, die haben immer behauptet, dass, dass Nummer 4 nicht äh, feuerfähig war. Yeah. Sie, die Engländer, haben immer, no, immer, immer ja. befürchtet. No, the guns were intact. We had no men, but the guns were intact. Es war intact. Shortly after midnight, a rather dull noise, uh, which uh, at the beginning seemed like a storm, we began to have the things moving. There was a piano in my room and different uh, ornaments on the piano. And we, we, we began to hear the slight moving of things, which was quite unusual. So we thought, uh, this is different from a storm. And it did last for a long time. And after 20 or 30 minutes, we said, no, it's D-Day, it's the invasion. Entrée. Merci. Fifty years later, the Grimaud family still lives in its house behind the invasion beach. Well, I'm happy to introduce you here because it is the house where we lived during the war, and especially in June 1944, mm -hmm. and that's, that's where D-Day reached us. I was living in the place on D-Day, and we lived the whole of D-Day, of course. You and your mother? My mother and my two sisters. Mm -hmm. We were in that house. And we were upstairs, of course, during the night. The rooms are upstairs. I was in that room at the uh, right-hand side there. Uh, and uh, had we stayed in our rooms, in these rooms, we wouldn't probably not have been alive because there were many, many shell splits in the rooms. Yeah. All the rooms in the village were more or less full of holes. And I had army, box, uh, army boxes, two, two of these boxes full of shell, shell splits, big shell splits. Splinters. Oh, yes. Yeah. So uh, we were joined by an aunt of ours who lived a mile out of the village, west of the village, and she told us, oh, the sea is, is firing. The sea is firing. She could so, so, so that, see that from the top of her house. Uh, I come to die with you. big battleships. They started firing 15-inch and 16-inch shells. And as we look back, we saw 
yellow or orange flashes and we saw brown mushrooms of cordite fumes rising in the air. Within seconds, there was a terrific bang as the noise hit us. But these big projectiles or uh, shells were going away into the interior, falling on the German soldiers. When dawn broke and one saw the sort of enormous armada that was assembled, that spirit of confidence became absolutely overwhelming. I remember I had a low level oblique aerial photograph of the point at which we were due to land. And I stood on the deck of the landing craft and I looked at my photograph and I looked at the land and there it was, it matched up. And this built up my confidence enormously. Just off Sword Beach, George Honor was commanding His Majesty's Midget Submarine X-23, waiting to guide the first wave of landing craft. We were sitting on the bottom a mile offshore from the Sunday morning until the Tuesday morning. The only time we saw anything happening was on the Sunday, when about two in the afternoon we had a, a periscope recce and we saw lorry loads of Germans coming down to the beach, obviously for their Sunday afternoon playtime. And we said at the time, till do they know what's coming? And also prayed, none of them were Olympic swimmers and could swim the mile offshore where we were. As we were approaching the beach, it looked as if a man with a flag was walking on the water. We had surfaced the X-craft and we were trimmed right down so that we were virtually level with the water. So when one clambered out of the hatch and got on the deck, you were literally standing on the water and one was lashed to the induction mast to stop being washed overboard. Is it the rum? You know, is it a mirage? Uh, from the age of 14, as I say, I'd always treated naval officers as, as next to God sort of thing, where this was pushed into us, and I thought, Jesus, they really do tread on water. The assault infantry had trained for this for years, knowing that the first troops to land on an enemy beach would be considered expendable. In training, this was how the landing was expected to go. As the landing craft touches the shore, down goes the door, and out hurtle the troops, led by the platoon commander. His job is to get as far up the beach as he can before he's hit or treads on a mine, and to carry his men with him. The important thing is to keep the assault going. If the first wave is wiped out, another and another follows. Among the first ashore at 7 a.m. was 19-year-old Sapper Lieutenant Ian Wilson. His unenviable job was clearing away the beach obstacles by blowing them up. The drill was that your demolition team of 24 men spread out on 24 obstacles, one man to one obstacle, and the team leader, whether it was the platoon sergeant or the platoon officer, uh, watched, and as each man completed his, his charge and was ready with his igniter, which was a simple pull-out safety pin, it was a pull igniter, um, he would raise his hand. And when the platoon officer saw all the hands raised, he would drop his, and everybody pulled their pull igniter, ran, as far as I can remember, there was about a five-second delay, which enabled you to run probably about 40 yards, lie down with your tin hat towards the, the explosion and hope for the best. Then you got up and did the same again on the next row. Did you volunteer for this? No. <laughs> the craft alongside us, it got struck by a large mortar shell. And there was troops jumping off there, and I remember the poor devils. I hope they make it. We started running down the ramps. Major Evans, our second in command, he was just ahead of me in the ramp. And he skidded, and he went up to his neck in water. 
as we came in, we hit what we thought was the beach. So the captain said, we're there. I said, down with the ramp. I was very hesitant to get off that boat because it was, it, I mean, it was murder. Down he went and totally disappeared. So I thought, oh, God, it, it isn't the beach, it's a sandbank, and he's gone into deep water. And there were people in about 30 yards away, in the hotels and houses, shooting at us with machine guns. The first man I seen dead, I looked at him and I thought, well, why is he sleeping? Because I was so naive about death. We ran up the beach, and all the time the noise, it was terrific. The bodies of Canadian soldiers were heaped up at the side of the water. I looked at this chap, he had a big ginger moustache, it could see him today now, and I just thought he was sleeping. And then I realised, looking at the back of his head, all his brains was on the sand. The first thing I saw was a dead Canadian soldier lying face down in the ocean, being drifted by the surf. I could feel something lumbering behind, and I turned round, and there was a flail tank. And I couldn't get away from it. It seemed to be getting there, and I thought, in no way am I going to be a bacon rind after traveling all this way. Up on the beach were about 150 wounded lying out. The transfusion officer for our uh, advanced surgical center had gone ashore with the first line of landing craft with a little trolley full of bottles of blood. And he called round and had blood transfusion set up on all the worst wounded uh, hanging from a, a, a rifle with a bayonet stuck into the sand. This is the BBC Home Service. Here is a special bulletin read by John Snag. D-Day has come. Early this morning, the Allies began the assault on the northwestern face of Hitler's European fortress. The first official news came just after half past nine. I had listened to the news on the morning of D-Day, and of course I heard immediately, immediately. So I called out to my mother, I'm going down to the church quickly, uh, and threw on my clothes. I said, look after the babies. I got on a, her bicycle, about 90 years old bicycle, shot down to the church and prayed very hard indeed. And so were um, thousands and thousands of others exactly the same as me. Earlier, Alerted by waves of low-flying British aircraft, Lieutenant Steiner had made for his bunker in the sand dunes. At seven o'clock, he telephoned his general and told him what he could see. Das Meer war voller Schiffe, jeder Größe. The sea was full of ships. Looking from one side to the other, I could hardly see any water. I'm not exaggerating. The boats were so close to each other. British and Canadian casualties on D-Day were fewer than had been feared. About 4,000 were killed and wounded. Some lost their lives or were maimed for the rest of their lives within a minute of landing. Many were teenagers who scarcely had time to live. Without the medical services, it would have been worse. The doctors had to improvise. We just worn a, a rubber apron and rolled our sleeves up. There were no gloves, there were no gowns. Uh, there were no towels covering. You just uh, cleaned up and, and operated on the kitchen table. I went over to the church, and there were 250 wounded there, including quite a lot of Germans, and there was a pile of dead outside amongst masses of uh, very sweet-scented pinks. I always associate the two. In the middle of it all, the unfortunate French, appalled by the death and destruction. I heard a terrible screaming, yelling. 
And as we entered the house there, there were three bodies. Two of them were very badly burnt, black. The other one was, was a flame. There were still flames coming out from the clothing of the person. They were all French. The, there were two or three people trying to beat out the flames of the person that was still alight. Um, but there was flesh and everything coming away, and the smell was violent. And I remember, I don't know why, but I remember trying to ask them who was responsible. I don't know, I felt guilty as, as one of the landing chiefs, but I didn't know, I uh, said to them, is it, is it Deutsch, Deutsch, uh, uh, Canadian, Angleterre? Uh, they just looked at me, there, there was no answer. I don't think that uh, they could co comprehend what had happened and how soon it happened. All round us, French civilians were, and firemen who wore brass helmets, they were tackling the flames of the blazing homes that uh, had been ignited by our shells. I came up to a house that was blazing furiously and there was uh, quite a pretty French lady approached me in a, it was either a ball gown or a nightgown, but she threw her arms round my neck and kissed me and I thought, well, that, this is good, this is grand and gosh, I, I'm quite glad I came. Meanwhile, the Americans landing on Utah Beach at 6.30 a.m. had achieved complete surprise. Only 200 men were killed and wounded. But Omaha Beach, the most heavily defended of the five, was a nightmare. The Germans were completing an anti-invasion exercise as the Americans landed, many of them in the wrong place. Partly that was due to bad weather, but also because the US Navy launched the boats and amphibious tanks a full 12 miles from the beach. Many foundered. Also, the Navy's bombardment was ineffective. It was 2 p.m. before the beach exits could be cleared. The landing at Omaha cost 2,000 American casualties. East of Pegasus Bridge that morning, the lightly armed British airborne troops, supported by a few hundred commandos, were awaiting a German counterattack. We had no anti-tank weapons at all, not uh, west side of the, uh, the Pegasus Bridge, and uh, very few bodies. Um, if they had sent through enough of their own troops and a few tanks, I've no doubt whatsoever they could have come straight through us. But the Germans were in total disarray. Convinced that the Allies would cross at the Straits of Dover, Hitler had stationed his strongest forces 150 miles up the coast. There was one German armoured division in the invasion area, but the overall commander, Rommel, was on leave in Germany, and had left his chief of staff, General Speidel, in charge. Colonel Hans von Luck had fought in Poland, France, the desert, and Russia. The uh, Army Group B, Rommel's Army Group, uh, was represented then when Rommel was absent by General Speidel. And when he got the news about the landing, he said, don't move because uh, that is a diversion. And the main landing will come in the north, Pas de Calais. Like Winston Churchill in 1940, Rommel had ordered his commanders to fight the enemy on the beaches. But when he got back to Normandy on D-Day afternoon, it was already far too late. When we informed the high command about the sea landing, after the airborne division came down, it was absolutely clear that it was a main landing. But still then they be be believed it's no, 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 it's, it's Pas de Calais. They were so fixed on Pas de Calais. The Allies had one priceless advantage, total command of the air. Over the beaches, German planes were almost as rare as penguins. Inland, Allied fighters patrolled the roads, knocking out whole convoys in a single sortie and delaying the arrival at the battlefield of surviving German reinforcements. Whenever planes appeared, they were always British. That didn't help our morale. 
Then we plunged into a terrible firestorm. It must have lasted at least an hour. It left such a deep impression on me. We felt great nervousness in our commanders and in the lower ranks too. As a young soldier, I sensed this. Nobody seemed to know what to do with us. That seemed strange to me. We were so in tune with these officers and they didn't know what was happening. The mood was extremely nervous. With the 100 divisions fighting the Soviet Red Army, the Germans were thin on the ground in France. Much of the coast was defended by low-grade units whose soldiers, including press-ganged Russians, were often glad to surrender. Surprisingly, we took some prisoners who were skulking in the dunes. And I suppose, as a 19-year-old youngster, I was sort of interested in the belt that they were wearing. And I asked one prisoner to show me his belt, which he took off. This has a leather belt, and it had a rectangular buckle. And on a crest in the middle of the belt buckle was written, Gott mit uns. And it was almost like a physical shock. I mean, I had been imbued with the, the thought of the righteousness of the Allied cause. And here were the Germans, who reckoned God was with them too. By midday, about 10,000 British soldiers were ashore, but not enough tanks and artillery. Strong winds had driven the tide high up the beaches, reducing the width of dry sand to a mere 30 feet and causing a monumental traffic jam. Some infantry units waited for hours for their armored support to arrive, and with that, the assault lost momentum. The key objective on D-Day was the city of Caen, 10 miles inland. The surrounding high ground would act as the base for breakout into open country beyond. Undoubtedly, this was ambitious. Two strongly defended German fortresses were blocking the way, and the 21st Panzer Division was straddling Caen. Early in the afternoon, one unit, the King's Shropshire Light Infantry, went forward on foot. A single squadron of tanks caught up. Together, but out on a limb, they dashed for Caen, only to be stopped and badly mauled three miles from the city. Except for the airborne, no major Allied unit achieved its D-Day objective. But Hitler's Atlantic Wall lay in ruins, and 150,000 Allied troops had landed in France by nightfall. Rommel had warned that if the invaders could hold a bridgehead for 24 hours, the war in the West would be lost. But as the Allies were about to find out, the enemy would quickly recover. D-Day was over. The battle for Normandy was about to begin. You can see part two, the battle for Normandy, tomorrow night at 5 to 10. And there'll be highlights of today's commemorative events at 11.50 tonight on BBC One.